I'm very pleased to announce the first speaker, Jenny Price. I feel very honored to introduce her because I know her for a long time. She was a student in Edinburgh, moved to New Zealand, and then went to Australia to do a lot of dairy cattle genetics work. And she will demonstrate to you about all the changes that happened in dairy cattle genetics over the time and predict the future. Thank you very much, Rul. Um, it's a real honour to be back here at World Bioetrics in Dublin. Um, I also had the privilege of presenting in Cairns. <laughs> and I can say that uh, I reckon that this is almost triple the audience that we had in Cairns. So thank you very much, Dublin, for your interest in genetics. Um, so without th further ado, I'm going to talk to you about uh, genomic selection for animal welfare and environmental impact traits. I think this is a really exciting time to be involved in genetics. And I think Rule and I have um, you know, such a, an, or have had such an opportunity to see some of the great advances just um, happening right in front of our, our faces. So it's a really great time. And I hope that I can bring some of the enthusiasm that I have for the subject to you this afternoon. So, a little bit about my talk today. Um, we're going to have a, a fairly easy start to, um, to this presentation. And I'm going to talk a, about very simple trait inheritance and then go on to the traits that we more often deal with in terms of selection, which are complex traits. They have very, very many genes that control them. So, um, I think there's also advances that are happening right now that are really interesting as well, such as gene editing. And I'll give a little bit of an example of how that can be used to um, uh, select for po the polled condition in, in cattle. Um, genomic selection, many of you have heard about this a lot in the past. I'll give a little bit of a rundown on how that actually works and some examples of where I think it's really powerful. And especially around these new traits such as um, our fertility that we've had or we've selected for for quite a while now, but health traits and environmental impact traits like greenhouse gas emissions, uh, heat tolerance, feed efficiency and so on. And then I'll wrap up a little bit. So that's a bit of an, an overview of, of what I'm going to talk about. So let's talk about real simple stuff, Punnett squares. Hopefully you can all remember this from your undergrad genetics lectures. Um, if you've got a black sire, which is homozygous for the um, uh, double R alleles, uh, and you mate that to a red dam, then you get all black offspring, but they are all heterozygous and carriers of the red, ge the red gene. If you mate some of those red dams, or sorry, black dams, which are, that are heterozygous to a red sire, then half of the progeny are red. So pretty simple stuff. And hopefully you can just work out that uh, on the fly. Go one step, step further, and then you have heterozygous dam and heterozygous sire, and a quarter of your progeny are red. But half of them are carriers. So really simple. It's exactly the same for polled, that except here, the polled condition is actually the dominant one, and the horned is the recessive. So if you mate a polled sire to um, a horned dam, then all of the progeny are polled, and so on. So if you go the next step and the next step, you can see that you get a mixture of horned and polled cattle. So it's exactly the same principles as you have for that red carrier. So very simple stuff. However, the allele frequency of that polled allele is very low. So it means that it's actually quite difficult to breed for in the population. And there's quite a difference between animals that are polled and those that aren't polled. So there's a study done a couple of years ago in the US by Dors Horst, and they found that the difference in genetic merit between polled and horned cattle is around about $252 per lactation. So there's a little bit of lag that we have to try and move forward if we use traditional means of selecting for polled. So we would call that like a genomic drag, that you have all of this material that you don't necessarily want when you want to select for that polled condition. So using traditional breeding methods, it would take about 20 years to get half of the population to be polled. So this is an example of where you where using really cutting edge uh, genetic technologies can give us a big leap forward. So gene editing that you may have heard about is one um, such example. 
Now, what gene editing is and how it differs from genetic modification is it's really like taking a pair of scissors to the genome that you can precisely cut the uh, section of DNA and add and replace uh, or even delete individual nucleotides. So it's incredibly precise and it gives us a whole new um, paradigm in terms of, of, of breeding. And it's actually already been used to um, breed polled cattle. So um, there's an example of uh, calves that are on the ground right now in um, uh, UC Davis in California that were developed using this genome editing technique using a process called talons. So it's already been being used. But it's not without controversy. Um, it's definitely different to genetic modification or transgenics because it's using the variation that already exists and we're not bringing in uh, DNA from other species to actually cause this uh, uh, difference or genetic modification. But it's still going to be, uh, I suppose, under scrutiny from the public and also from the regulators. So it's going to take a while before this technology becomes mainstream. And I think that there's a big question mark in terms of how you can use this technology to balance uh, things that are important for both human and animal welfare uh, against human, uh, people's concerns for using these sorts of technologies. So there's a real conundrum of acceptance for this right now. But I think that this is what we'll see uh, being under discussion over the next um, five, ten years or so. And, and hopefully it, it will um, be used for good effect, such as the example that I've given. So the rest of my talk is going to be in more, the more traditional sense of what we have used selection for, for quantitative traits. So traits such as milk and fertility and so on, they're controlled by very many genes. And if you actually look at a population and you plot out their individual values, you get that sort of bell curve. So no matter what trait you look at, if it's controlled by many genes, it usually has that underlying distribution that you can use to select the very best animals. Now, genomics has taken us, uh, I think, a real big step forward in terms of being able to capture this variation by being able to pick up all the bits of DNA that are associated with individual traits. And I'll give you a few examples of that. So here we have a reference population where we've got a bunch of animals, or a bunch of cows that have got uh, phenotypes, say for milk production, and they've all been genotyped as well. The next step is that we'll estimate each of those marker effects simultaneously um, to get their effect on the trait of interest. So if we take milk production, for example, each copy of that T allele is worth 0 0.02 litres. And if we estimate all of the other effects simultaneously, we'll get their effect on milk yield. And then simply what you do is you multiply the, um, the weight that you get for each position by the genotype that that animal has at that position. So it's a very straightforward process except that it involves simultaneous estimation of multi-genetic uh, markers. So how we apply this is we have a, a reference population, as I described before, that you derive that prediction equation. And then you have a bunch of animals that you want to know their breeding value. So they're the selection candidates. You actually apply that prediction equation to those selection candidates, and that enables you to predict the very or to predict their their genetic merit, and then pick the best ones um, for the next stage of selection. So, say you wanted to pick the best ones for carcass weight if they're pigs, or milk production if they're cows. The real game changer with this is that it's just made for traits that are very difficult or expensive to measure that all of a sudden you can generate uh, uh, genomic prediction equations for traits where you have a reasonably small reference population that are all genotyped. And I'll give some examples um, later on in my presentation of how that can be applied. So from a practical sense, if you're a farmer, what does it mean? If you're looking at a bunch of heifers that you've got as replacements, 
then just by taking some tail hairs or an ear notch sample so that you can extract the DNA from that calf, you've got seven lactations worth of information. You can tell how good that heifer is right at, at birth. So it's incredibly valuable for making decisions as to which replacements you'd like to keep on farm. If you're in the bull buying area and you want to know how much confidence that would give you to a, to a breeding value that you estimate on an individual, then this gives you, this graph shows the, the red lines of the 95% confidence interval around the breeding value at different stages of life. So at birth, before you have any DNA information, you've got a massive 95 confidence interval. You pull that down greatly when you go to um, getting a genomic breeding value for that individual and a reliability of 60%. We're getting close to what would have taken over five years with traditional progeny tests to be able to achieve, just like that through taking tail hair samples. So it's an incredibly um, valuable technique to get that genetic merit of an animal right at birth without having to wait until the daughters have production records. So this is just an example to show that it works. Um, the x-axis along the bottom is the genomic breeding value before you have daughters, and on the y-axis is the breeding value after you have daughters. And you can see that there's a very close relationship and that the regression line is about one, so there's no bias in the estimates as well. So it works. It works. It's as good as having a progeny test. Not quite as reliable, but we're working on it, using different methods to try and increase the reliability all the time. And that's actually what a lot of the research that's happening in animal breeding right now is focused on, is using information from sequence data and so on to try and improve that reliability even further. I'm going to take a little bit of a detour now onto breeding objectives. And I suppose the, the main um, thrust of what I, I want to talk to you about this afternoon, because I think there's really exciting things happening in this space as well. So I found this paper um, a few years ago, written by Boishard and Brochard, and I think it kind of sums up a lot of where my personal thinking is in terms of future directions of breeding objectives that they're underpinned by three different pillars of sustainability. As animal breeders, we've certainly focused very much on the economic outcomes of using different breeding objectives and selection decisions. But I think as we move forward, there's going to be more and more um, of the social implications, environmental implications in terms of our breeding programs. And I'll add a, a little bit more to that as I go on with my talk with what we've been doing in Australia recently. But examples of traits um, that might be uh, underpinning economics are things like health, feed efficiency, production, fertility, and so on, social, welfare, greenhouse gases, and so on, and environmental, obviously, you've got greenhouse gases and resource availability. So there's definitely some traits that we can work on that are new that we haven't looked at before. But I think you have to be really careful about what you wish for. And... It's an area that, as animal breeders, we've come unstuck on in the past by being very much focused on production in the 80s and 90s, that we kind of took our eye off the ball in terms of what else was happening to dairy cattle. So if you go all out for production, as we all now know, there are pretty dire consequences for dairy cow fertility even though it's a low heritability trait, there's lots of genetic variation there. It just means that the environmental variation is massive in comparison, and you can actually make really good rates of genetic gain in fertility through selection. A low heritability is still um, a heritability that you can breed for improvements. So this is... Um, data from 15 countries and about five to seven million cows per dot or per year. And it shows, I suppose, firstly, the situation that we were in in the late 90s, early 2000s, 
but hopefully it also illustrates that we're plateauing in terms of uh, the bad news for fertility and hopefully heading in, in a good direction in genetic trends. So if you actually look at the uh, phenotypic trend in the 90s, we were going at a heck of a rate in terms of deteriorating fertility. Worldwide, it was one and a quarter days per year, or about 0.3% of the phenotypic mean. So it was pretty dire. But there are really good um, illustrations of how we're managing to turn this around. So I've just cho chosen two examples here, one um, from Ireland and the other from Australia. This is from Donna Berry's 2014 paper. And the light blue bar on the left shows the theoretical response to selection. We deal with these things called selection indices that we can actually predict the rate of genetic gain that you would expect in a population. And you can see that in, in Australia, we had a, a lower expectation based on our current selection index because we have less of a weight on fertility and our breeding objective compared to Ireland. But certainly in recent years, we've been able to match um, the theoretical rate of genetic gain with real daughters um, that are born on farm. And actually in Ireland, there's an even greater rate of genetic gain compared to theory, which is probably because farmers are voting with their feet and making sure that they're using high fertility bulls. And I think that's probably the same is true in very many countries around the world, that farmers are wanting to use high fertility breeding value bulls in their breeding programs. So how do we pull this off? It's the same, actually, for, for different countries around the world. I've obviously used Australia as an example. Um, this is from the Australian Dairy Herd Improvement Scheme, and they offer three different flavours of selection index for farmers to use. There's the economic index, which is the balanced performance index, and it includes things like production, fertility, cell count, got this thing called feed saved or feed efficiency, which I'll talk about later. There's also a bit of type in there, survival and workability, which is things like milking speed and temperament and so on. Now, the reason why we've got three flavours is because we've, I suppose, developed a bit of a social experiment ourselves, that we asked the farmers what they wanted to breed for. And we actually ended up grouping the farmers into three categories, or identifying that there were three categories. There's your profit-focused farmers. They're the ones that use the, the balanced performance index, and they're actually the majority of Australian dairy farmers. You've then got another group of farmers who are really keen to improve health and fertility in their herds. They use the health-weighted index. And we've got another group who are more focused on type. They completely ignore that type-weighted index. It's not the sort of type that they want to breed for, but it was actually our first effort at trying to develop an index that was appealing to them. So we've got a little bit of uh, a way to go in terms of convincing those type-focused farmers. Maybe they're never going to get on board. I, I could probably have a good conversation <laughs> with Rule about that. But at least we're trying to do something for that group of farmers. Um, so ultimately, we may end up with two different indices in Australia. We'll see how it goes. Many people ask, but if you have a lot of traits in your index, don't you end up diluting the selection response that you get? Well, you do kind of. If you look at individual traits, then if you have one trait in the index, you obviously achieve 100% of that response. If you've got two traits, they're uncorrelated, they've got the same economic value, then you end up with 50% of the response, and so on until you get to very many traits. The important thing is, though, that as you add more and more traits to your index, the economic response continues to climb. And you get to a stage where you end up with nearly three times the economic response by having all of those traits that contribute to profitability. So I would say it's always worthwhile adding extra traits as long as they contribute to your overall breeding objective. And 
perhaps we may take a little bit of a, a divergence here and not only have breeding objectives that focus on economics, but also those social and environmental consequences as well. So I, I'm not going to, I suppose, go through this slide in any detail, but I just wanted to show that these indices do actually work. This is the actual rates of genetic gain in Australian Holsteins. A lot of the farmers, um, uh, I suppose, are picking bulls that are um, making their first cut on the, the bulls that are, to do, that are ranked highly on those indices, and then they make secondary decisions, such as going for the bulls that have even higher fertility breeding values. The reason why there's a slight negative for weight or live weight um, is because we have a, a little bit of a, ne a negative economic value um, on that trait in the breeding objective, and it's probably because of the group of bulls that are coming through in recent years, because we weren't seeing that through the late 2000s. It's only in recent years. Oh, yeah, I just gave us, a, ourselves a gold star for what we've achieved in fertility. <laughs> so... In terms of new directions in breeding, um, this isn't an exhaustive list by any means, and it's actually a little bit of an insight into the traits that we're focused on in, in Australia. Um, so I don't mean for this to imply that we're no longer interested in production and longevity. Of course we are, but we have breeding values for those traits already. These are the new kids on the block and breeding values that we're attempting to use data that we either currently collect or are going to collect um, to make these sorts of, or breeding for these sorts of traits a reality. There are a few issues um, and challenges, I guess, in terms of making these breeding values actually happen. The first is to be able to come across the source of phenotypic data? Is that data available in commercial herds? Or do you actually need to set up experiments and have it running in um, research herds to be able to collect the data that you need for these breeding values? How much do the phenotypes cost? Is it going to really break the bank by trying to develop breeding values for these traits? You know, things like measuring individual feed intakes is incredibly expensive. So we need to think of different ways to actually go about developing breeding values for those traits. Then, of course, you need to estimate the genetic parameters. What's the heritability? Should I be using the new genomic methodologies or just using pedigree relationships? Is it more appropriate to use a male reference population where you have daughters of bulls that you use to create the genomic prediction equations? Or should you use females in the reference population? And lastly, of course, we want to make sure that using those breeding values takes us in the direction that we want to go. So this has to be constant evaluating and monitoring of genetic progress and looking at um, other consequences of, of selection through um, having these breeding values. So this is what we have in Australia in terms of reference populations. We f work, well, we've, we've worked out that for traits that are expensive, that are too costly, we need to work with research herds to be able to get the phenotypes and genotypes um, for our genomic predictions. So we mainly work with our own research herd at Allen Bank um, to capture or get the data that we need for these really expensive traits like feed efficiency and methane emissions. Where the traits are easier to measure, we go to commercial herds. So we've got a genomic reference population of around about 30,000 cows that we can tap into data sources on health and heat tolerance and so on, and obviously new traits as well. So this is what our reference population looks like. We've got a bunch of bulls that have got daughters. So we've got Holstein bulls, around about 4,000 of them that have got Australian daughters. Then a few years ago, we added genotyped Holstein females to the reference population, and also Jersey bulls that are um, genotyped, and also cows. In the last few months, I've been biting my fingernails on what would happen if we added 
a much larger female reference population to our existing genomic reference population. So we added 18,000 Holsteins, Jerseys and their crosses to our reference population. And we were interested to see, was this going to result in an increase in reliability, which is our main, I suppose, benchmark of how well we're doing in terms of um, adding more animals to the reference population. Luckily for me, <laughs> it did result in an increase in reliability. We had more Holsteins in the reference population, and they were probably less related to our existing reference population, so we got a bigger kick from adding those cows. So somewhere between 5 and 7% was the little bit of red, or the bit that we added on to the existing genomic reliabilities. We also saw improvements in the reliabilities that we got for the Jersey population, but they were a little bit more modest, so we weren't getting quite as big a kick. Um, again, we're working on trying to improve these reliabilities further still. We're pretty happy that we're up at the 70% mark for reliability of production traits, but we want to try and do better than that, and especially for those traits um, that we currently have lower genomic reliability. So fertility, for example, we'd really like to get that much higher. So next trait that I'm going to talk about is feed efficiency. It's, I suppose the reason why I chose this was because I thought it was a nice example of where you use a dedicated reference population to develop a breeding value. So this is using our Ellenbank research herd, um, where we've got very small numbers. And I think there's a little bit of a, um, sorry, before I go to that, there's a little bit of a message here that anybody who's sitting on a, or is thinking about setting up an experiment for large numbers of phenotypes, where there's no sort of feeding treatment as such, then it could actually lend itself to genomic prediction. If you think about genotyping those animals, you may actually end up with a genomic prediction for the trait of interest. And I think this is a really good example of an area where animal scientists and veterinarians can work together very well with geneticists to be able to develop future genomic breeding values. So anyway, let's get back to the main topic, which is the, the feed intake or feed efficiency. And as I mentioned, this is oh, expensive and painful to measure. We had these uh, feed intake units custom built in New Zealand. Um, they were the same as our sister trial at Dairy NZ, so we had exactly the same equipment. And each side of the Tasman, we measured around about 1,000 growing heifers. We then went on to move this very expensive equipment down from our Rutherglen site, which is in northern Victoria, down to um, near Melbourne in, in Allen Bank. Um, the reason why was we wanted to see whether efficiency in growing heifers was the same as lactating cows. They are correlated, actually. So we can use information from growing heifers and lactating cows on this feed efficiency trait. So the trait that we were looking at is what's called residual feed intake, which is the difference between actual and predicted feed intake. We ended up with a reference population that we, we currently use for our genomic breeding value of around about 234 domestic cows. So these have got individual feed intake records over a 30-day period. Um, we've got daily feed intakes. We've also got, I suppose, feeding behavior. We know exactly when the cows were eating and so on. We've also got those growing heifers, the domestic heifers. We had about 840 of those that we added to our reference population. And then um, I talked to Rule <laughs> and uh, collaborators in the UK, and we ended up with around about 1,000 Dutch and UK cows that also have individual intakes that we were able to add to our reference population. I think this is a really good example of where global collaboration is very important. So as, a, as, a, as an individual country, say for Australia or for Ireland, it's actually very difficult or too expensive to build up the reference population independently. 
So um, Rule led uh, what's known as the Global, Mat Global Dry Matter Initiative to bring in different countries who have feed intake data. And we've worked together to try and build a very big data set on feed intake on genotyped animals. And I think at the moment we're running on around about 6,000 cows that have that data. We only use part of it for our reference population, but I think there's certainly opportunities into the future to grow that reference population further. And I'm, I'm sure that as the Netherlands and Australia currently have feed efficiency breeding values, those are likely to, to, to um, happen in other countries over the next few years as well. So it's a really exciting time for being able to breed for this very important trait. So what we actually do to calculate our feed saved breeding values is we combine that residual feed intake trait, so that's the difference between actual and predicted feed intake, with maintenance that's calculated from body weight breeding values. And here we calculate body weight using uh, type confirmation. So we use the stature, the chest width, and the body depth of the animals to be able to get an estimate of their breeding value for body weight. Um, residual feed intake is only available on genotyped Holsteins. So where we don't have that information for the top part of the residual feed intake part, we just calculate feed saved from the maintenance part or just from body weight. So it means that it's flexible, that you have breeding values for this trait, no matter whether an animal is genotyped or not a Holstein, for example. Actually developing or, or going forward with this trait in other breeds is difficult because you, again, have to build a reference population um, to... <coughs> Uh, to have this sort of phenotype. Um, I think that advances in using sequence data should actually help us here because we should be able to bridge the gap between um, uh, breed predictions. At the moment, we can't predict very well from one breed to another, but I think that's an area that we'll see big improvements over the next few years using sequence data. This is an example of, well, first of all, the reliabilities that we achieve for this trait. They're a bit lower than for most of the other breeding values that we published, so they're about 37%, a bit lower than fertility, for example, um, quite a bit lower than production, which is around about 70%. However, there are differences between bulls that are at the top of the um, balanced performance index, or the BPI, and you can see there that there's bulls D, G and J, whose daughters we predict would save uh, over 100 kilos of feed per year. So it may not sound like a, a lot on the scale of things, but you've got to remember that breeding is permanent and cumulative. So if you continue to make that same selection decision over many successive years, then you will see a big impact of selecting for these traits. It's exactly the same as fertility, that it may not look like a big deal um, in the short term, but if you stick with it, you will see the benefits. Another trait that I thought I'd mention is heat tolerance. So being from Australia, we get a bit of warm weather. <laughs> um, I'd probably say that in Europe, maybe cold stress is uh, a trait that <laughs> would be of interest, but actually, the tipping point for a cow heading from that thermoneutral zone to the heat, heat stress zone isn't particularly high. So it's somewhere in the region of about 20 degrees with 60% relative humidity, um, you start to see an effect of heat stress. So we worked um, on building a data set here of animals that were genotyped and have also got production records. So we got production records from um, the Australian Dairy Herd Im Improvement Scheme um, for Holsteins and Jerseys. And we matched this up with Bureau of Meteorology data. So we actually went to BOM, as it's known, and we matched together the nearest weather station to the postcode of a particular herd so that we could look to see what the individual daily potential heat stress would be on cows in that herd. The phenotype that we looked at was fairly simple. 
if you take two cows where you have, I suppose, a growing <coughs> level of heat stress to the situation on the right, which is a pretty warm day in Australia, then you can see that cow A tolerates heat better than cow B. So her drop-off in production is less. And that's actually what we're looking at, is pretty much the slope of that line when you pass a certain threshold. So which cows, um, I suppose, lose the least amount of, of um, production as you get to higher temperatures. We've calculated genomic predictions for this trait. We've got accuracies of between 0.43 and 0.55, and we're on track to hopefully release this as a genomic breeding value in the next 12 to 18 months. So this is the next breeding value that's, that's going to be literally hot in Australia. Um, <clears throat> we also had a look at validating this experiment or this genomic breeding value. So what we did was we went all across Australia, looked for animals that were divergent for this genomic breeding value, so the highest and the lowest for um, heat tolerance. There's not actually a huge difference between the groups in their heat tolerance breeding values, but what we did see was consistently throughout the experiments, so from days one to four, for the rectal temperature on the left-hand side, there were significant differences for at least two of those days. And you can see that there appears to be a bit of a trend um, in terms of their uh, response to that high or challenge, if you like. So what we did was we actually put the cows into these contained boxes and we elevated the temperature and humidity. So it was around about 30 degrees, 32 degrees. We saw the same thing with the intravaginal temperatures. So the heat tolerant animals were able to somehow keep their cool when the heat stressed animals just couldn't do that. So there's a physiological basis to this trait as well, which is really, I think, quite encouraging that we're finding through our genomic breeding values something that could um, have a, a, a very much a difference in terms of how animals are able to deal with heat stress in um, typical Australian climatic situations. The last thing that I wanted to just briefly touch upon was um, another exciting area in terms of using new information and new data to come up with predictions of novel traits. And this is using mid-infrared spectral data, which is pretty much shining a light through a milk sample and looking at the spectra of wavelengths that you get for um, that particular milk sample. It's what's currently used for quantifying fat and protein percentage in milk samples. And it's also been shown to be useful for predicting novel traits, such as ketosis, energy balance, feed efficiencies, and so on. Um, we think that there's uh, a lot of, I suppose, mileage in terms of using the spectral data as a way of um, coming up with additional predictors for traits that we're interested in. We haven't looked at it for a trait like heat tolerance, but perhaps there is some kind of biological basis that we can pick up in that milk signature for, um, for cows. Conclusions. <laughs> <laughs> rules to show me the five minute time. <laughs> so um, it's been said by um, my good friend Donna Berry that health is the new fertility. It's something that we certainly need to focus breeding on um, into the future. Traits like heat tolerance may be not an immediate value in, in countries like Ireland or my native UK, but it's certainly really important when um, uh, you have environments where heat stress really does make a difference on cows, such as US and Australia and so on. Um, <clears throat>
I think that there are real big opportunities in working together with different research organisations and I'd certainly encourage you to think about phenotyping opportunities for any of the research that you're involved in and how that could be perhaps translated into genomic breeding values of the future. I think there are opportunities as well to use traits or things like mid-infrared spectral data to come up with new either management decisions and, and hopefully use that as well to um, uh, reinforce our predictions of breeding values as well. Um, it's certainly more cost effective to use cow populations when you have expensive phenotypes but I think it's case by case that you actually have to work with the phenotype and work out actually what's the best way of making genetic progress in this trait and how should I be collecting the phenotypes. Um, I think that uh, welfare and environmental traits will definitely, they are, they're already being included in national selection indices, but they should be, I suppose, monitored in terms of their selection impact. If you're somebody who's really practical and you're looking for some very simple take-home messages from this talk, and I was just thinking about what would be my advice to, to farmers or perhaps veterinarians who are advising farmers, then I'd say use the selection index in the country that you're working in, such as in Australia, BPI, HWI or TWI, so those are our three selection indices, if you're in Ireland, then it's making a first short list on the, the EBI, net merit in the USA. Genomics is certainly here to say, and I wouldn't, um, I suppose, steer away from those bulls, but it's, it's worth spreading the risk. So it's worth having a larger group of genomic bulls if farmers are interested in using those in those breeding programs. So I would say roughly about two times the numbers of bulls. Questions. Thank you very much for your attention. If you use, wait for the microphone there. There's a question there. Please state your name and uh, your affiliation so we know who's talking to Jenny. Yes, thank you for the nice talk. I'm Paul Korbisk from Friedrich Löffler Institute, Germany, here in the back. I have two short questions. First one, um, how would you estimate the influence of aspiration of cells, for example, in a stage of blastocysts on DNA methylation or histone modification? And the second one is, um, which tool do you think or which one would you recommend in cattle production of the gene editing ones, CRISPR-Cas or zinc fingers? Yeah. What do you think? Okay, thank you for the questions. Um, I think I'd have to have a chat with you on the first question because it's quite difficult to answer cold. You know, I think uh, you, it, it's worth understanding the phenotype and then trying to figure out what the best way to, to scale it up in terms of developing genomic predictions. So I'd be quite happy to have a chat with you afterwards. And I'm, I'm kind of going to dodge out of the second question as well because it's it's not really my area of expertise we're working with uh, CRISPR or Talon's techniques um, I think that the underlying principles are the same that you end up with gene editing so I wouldn't necessarily put uh, my money on either technique right now but I think that the outcome is the important part and they both achieve that uh, Josip Daud, uh, Croatia, uh, Worldwide Science. Uh, I would like to ask you, uh, I noticed from your uh, presentation that you're uh, alone, that you not uh, cope with Eurogenomics or North Americans, what uh, I haven't noticed, and I'm really glad that you had uh, this heat index because uh, Zoetis started in the United States, this wellness race. I don't know if you are, uh, uh, know about ketosis, tolerance, and all that. Uh, my question would be, uh, how uh, could you get uh, reliability uh, with your reference population? And if you compare it uh, with uh, these both uh, associations, uh, like Eurogenomics or North America, or do you uh, maybe work together or to get higher reliability yeah. in such a trait? Thank you. Yeah, so we're, we're quite a big island. 
<laughs> in the southern hemisphere and we have um, worked alone I suppose in the past we've um, put a lot of effort as you could see into building our own reference population however um, over the last 12 months we've been working with um, the USA consortium and we added their reference population into ours and had a look at the effect on reliabilities. And we could see another lift of around about 5% for many of the traits. So we're currently talking, I suppose, um, to the US. It's certainly um, not a done deal yet, but the research looks really promising um, for adding that sort of reference population. So I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't quite get your second question, or was that? Uh, that, was, that was it. Th that was the question. I just okay. comment about okay. these uh, wellness traits just uh, uh, went out from Zoetis. Uh, uh, it's yeah. something, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yep. aerogenomics doesn't have it yet, but I have seen that you are working yes. on welfare is uh, yes. called uh, in Australia, yeah, so as you mentioned. So I am aware of that, and I, I think um, I would, um, have a little bit of caution um, with applying that type of um, index in a country like Australia because, of course, there is genotype by environment interactions and we know that many of the, the health and welfare traits are, uh, and heat tolerance most likely are sensitive to those G by E interactions. So I think um, any product like that has to be tested rigorously in the country that it's going to be used. That would be my advice. Yeah, thank you. We've got time for two very short questions and short answers, please. Hi, I'm Sanjay from University of Guelph and Chagas. I just have a, a like, I would like to know your view, general view on uh, application of genome editing for a complex trait, like what should oh, be the yeah. sh starting point? Yes, so there's some um, quite a bit of research um, from well, University of Edinburgh comes to mind, so John Hickey and co, that's looked at um, using genome editing in complex traits, and the results look very promising. So some of the examples that they're giving is, is by applying a reasonably small number of edits that you can actually lift the rate of genetic gain. Um, it's, it's very much a, a perfect world scenario that they're dealing with at the moment. It's simulations, so it's a little bit more complicated when you deal with real data, but certainly the simulations look very promising if you can get the edits right. And that means that we need to understand a lot more about the underlying biology around many of these traits. That's really important as a first step. Final question. Okay, th thanks, Jenny, for your talk. I'm Laura Boyle. I work in Moor Park, um, and Donna and I have been discussing a lot lately about trying to identify welfare traits for inclusion yep. in the EBI. And I, I work in welfare, and he's genetics, obviously. And we struggle to find to to be able to identify because, of course, he will always say, "Well, what is welfare?" And and it's difficult to define in that. And I suppose the only conclusions we could come to were that lameness is still probably one of the most important. Yes. Um, but like, did we miss something? Can you think of any other welfare indices or welfare traits out there that, 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 that could be useful, you know, um, outside of heat stress and, and lameness? Because mm. we struggled <laughs> to find I, any. <laughs> I, th I think that's um, another area that would be really good to have more international dialogue on, because I think... Um, we're all facing the same issues. We'd probably handle them in different ways. So, you know, for example, lameness in Australia is quite different. I, I'm very wary about talking about this in front of a group of vets. <laughs> but obviously, you know, cows walking long distances is quite different from confined systems. And, and you probably have a... Well, certainly in Europe, there's a mixture of different types of systems. You know, Irish cows are out at pasture most of the year, whereas... UK Dutch cows are pretty much inside, so. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Can I stop you there? Yeah. <laughs> There's plenty of time after the, this to discuss further on these subjects. So let me th thank Jenny once more for an excellent presentation.